Well, this morning we're taking a little break from the norm. So if you are new or visiting, we would typically go through books of the Bible for most of the year, straight through God's Word. We just finished up the book of Proverbs. And in a couple weeks, we're going to start... Colossians. Colossians. Ah, see? Some people, some people heard... Some people know it's coming up. Last few months, we've been accruing a little extra special lesson, though, as part of our services. We've been kind of hitting three simple lessons, one for each of our fun day Sundays as we've had them. And we'll be finishing that up, kind of forming a three-part series. And today we'll finish up with Matthew 28, 19 through 20. In just a moment, we'll read that. But before that, if I was to say to you the words space, the final frontier. The, the laughter indicates most of you would know what I was talking about, right? And would even roughly know, some of you, how to finish that short declaration, almost like you would memorized a Bible verse. Some of you know it by heart. I know this. I learned it, of course, watching Star Trek. And I wasn't alive in the 60s, but my dad was a fan. And then we watched, he showed me as a kid, we would watch this show. And it's been, it's now, right, 60s show. It's been over 50 years, heading for 60 and not just Star Trek, but then the next generation and the next, 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 next generation. But that, the whole thing went like this. It went space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the starship Enterprise. Enterprise. It's five-year mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no man has gone before. Now, there's three things happening in that declaration. There's three beats. It accomplishes three things. We establish the what, space, right? The final frontier, the object of our attention, what we're talking about. This is establishing the playing field. It's setting the stage for us, the lay of the land. Then we get, of course, the who. These are the voyages of the starship, Enterprise. Now we're establishing our characters and and their identity. And then they have a mission to explore strange new worlds, seek out new life and civilizations, boldly going where no man has gone before. And in fact, Future episodes of the uh, future incarnations of the show would say not just five year mission, but continuing mission, ongoing mission. And in a way, these three components actually are kind of what we've been building here over these three different messages. And we looked at John 3.16, which it very succinctly establishes what God has done. That's setting the lay of the land for us. This is the playing field. What God has done, God sent his son. We're not talking about space, we're talking about Christ. The 2 Corinthians 5.20 would then give us the who, who we are in Christ. It talks about we are ambassadors. We are called to be ambassadors for Christ, making his appeal. And so Matthew 8 and 28, 19 through 20, basically then establishes, well, now that we are or have this enterprise together, we're the church, and we see God's mission for us then as Jesus tells us to go and boldly seek and do something on his behalf. It's the last thing the risen Jesus did before Scripture tells us he ascended into heaven. He said these words in Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Would you stand with me just for the reading of the word? It's only two verses, so it won't be that long. Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always to the end of the age. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So I want us to explore a little bit. And he says, make disciples. Teach them. In fact, he says, baptize them. Now we know that that has a literal connotation. We had a baptism, we had a baptism this year. We immerse somebody in the water. Like that's something that we're supposed to do physically. We also understand that he gives us a baptism spiritually as well. But that word actually has an interesting connotation that I think stretches even to a metaphor for what we're talking about today. We're also supposed to be immersed in both the knowledge of God and immersed in understanding his redemptive work throughout all of history. We might call it, we might call the entirety of this universe redemptive history. And we're supposed to be steeped in that, saturated in that. So that's a phrase I want us to get embedded in our heads today, redemptive history. Because some questions emerge as we, as we read this simple statement. Okay, well, great, disciple the nations. How do we do that? How do we disciple the nations in general? And then we would say, okay, wait, how do we disciple the nations in the 21st century? How do we invite folks to consider the faith that we hold dear? To listen to 
the teaching we want to give to them, to ask them to consider becoming disciples. And one thing, first of all, our appeal in these confusing times that we live in today, I think something we have to stress as we have these conversations, as we live out our commission, is that we have a reasonable and informed faith. At the nature of belief and the nature of faith is something woefully misunderstood today. Because a lot of people, even some Christians, can sometimes find themselves thinking or focusing on the fact that we celebrate what John 3.16 said, right? 2,000 years ago, someone came into history and there was a significant thing that we want to talk about, and that's Jesus. It's a 2,000-year-old story that was an historical event, according to Christians, a man who seemed to have no sin, nothing to convict him of. A man who taught and caused quite a stir with his teaching to all who actually were listening. By all accounts, he healed the sick. He performed miracles. He did miraculous things that defied typical human understanding. And a man who was crucified, again, no discernible crime that he was condemned for, save for perhaps blasphemy, for claiming to be God which he did not deny, but he actually honestly qualified. I am, he said, and he went to the cross. And on Sunday, Christians gather and celebrate that three days later he rose again. As he said he would, the tomb was empty. And although people were startled and confused, he appeared to hundreds and clarified that divinity. His power and his power to save. And now we wait as Christians on the final act of God's passion play, again, across redemptive history. And as we work and walk and seek then to live out that great commission, we're called to explain the faith that we have. And a lot of people, when asked, even Christians, they say things like, well, I believe it's true. Now, we do believe this and believe it's true. And you ask me and you ask any Christian, well, why we celebrate this, that's an honest answer coming from our heart. I believe it to be true. But, But that's a problem for some today. I'm not saying that statement isn't true, but is it exhaustive and is it truly and clearly the commission that we're called to be taking to the world? Is it sufficient in responding to another person's inquiry in a world where, well, I believe it's true, but, well, and I believe this is true. What is that? Is that sufficient for our great commission? Right, to another individual or to another group, it's certainly not all I would say. I just believe it. It's not enough. It's not the answer that we even hear from the disciples as they share and spread the word through the book of Acts and then in the epistles that Paul and Peter write and others. In fact, Scripture tells us it's absolutely not all that we should be saying because by itself, I believe it's true doesn't mean much. Right? I might believe unicorns are true. I might believe Bigfoot is true. I might believe a flying spaghetti monster is true. I can believe all these things are true and it really doesn't matter. In fact, today, and then people will say things like, well, it feels true to me. Whatever you feel, that's true. Well, that's a problem. If I just say, I believe it's true, I'll say, well, I believe this is true. There's no invitation. There's no invitation to believe, and there's nothing articulating why one's to believe, to be believed versus the other. Nowadays, we're even told just whatever you feel, that's true. Just if it makes you feel good, believe it. It feels true to me. But that doesn't make it true. That doesn't make it reality. If I say it feels true, we've leached the entire weight out of the definition of truth. I mean, alternately, we'll stand in a court of law and say we swear to tell nothing but the truth. It's like, well, is that whatever I feel? Is that what feels true to me in the moment? I'm not sure the judge or jury would appreciate that. I mean, at this point, there is, at this point, just whatever feels true, well, then there's no truth. It's like in that movie, The Incredibles. When the, kid, when, the, when the villain says, and when everyone's super, no one will be. Right? Like if everybody on the entire planet had the exact same superpower, well, then it wouldn't be a superpower. It's something everybody has. It'd just be part of the normal experience of being human. It wouldn't be superhuman if we could all fly. Super stands in comparison to normal. By the same token, true stands in comparison to untrue things. If anything you feel can be true, there is no truth. It's ridiculous. Then when it comes to religion, actually that would mean Karl Marx is right. All our truth claims, all our religions, they're just opiates for the masses. A mythical medication against a harsh reality. However you want to perceive the world is just fine. Sure, go ahead. 
which sounds very loving and sweet, and if it sounds very tolerant, until you consider something like, I don't know, gravity? You know, I don't, well, I don't believe in the law of gravity. It doesn't feel true to me. It's like, well, it's gonna. <laughs> if you walk off that cliff, you're gonna die. You can say, well, I don't believe that that's true for you, but it's not true for me. Well, have a nice summer, we'll see you in the fall, right? Gravity believes in you, whether you believe it or not. When we hit the, when we hit the bottom line, we know we live in a reality where many things are true or false. Either unicorns are real, or they're a myth. Bigfoot is real, or you can zoom in and see the zipper on the suit, right? Either the flying pasta monster is false, or I need to be very wary next time I go to the spaghetti factory, right? That, and it's the same thing with believing in Jesus Christ. Did he or didn't he? Either Jesus rose from the dead, or it's a nice fairy tale to give us comfort in an uncomfortable world. Either he just, he's just something mythical to give us a sense of meaning in a world that we really know is just meaningless and came out of a big bang. Right? To even disciple others today, to even get to our great commission or maybe to sort of spark and get it off out of the gate, we, we, for me, have to establish first that truth even matters. True or false matters. Establishing reality matters. Either there is a creator or there is not. Either life is meaningless, so you should just go enjoy it while you can, fabricate a sense of meaning for yourself during your life, temporary and fleeting meaning, just so you don't go insane in this crazy world. Or you could choose to go out and actually investigate and see if there is a meaning, see if there's objective truth or a path we are supposed to be on as humankind. If there is a God, if there's a true narrative to our history that has a beginning and a middle and an end, that matters. Knowing that would matter. Knowing that, and if, and if you knew it and knew it mattered, then sharing it really matters. It might be something that you do feel inherently, like deep down. It's, well, I just, I feel, and I, I feel like I know there's a God. Well, that's not enough. Not if we want to fulfill that great commission. It's more than a feeling. Notice I said investigate. I, I chose that word for a reason. Because that means more than just what most of us think when we say the word faith. A like culture today likes to dismiss Christians and others. They say, well, you believe things by faith. I, I, put, my, I, I put my belief in you know, reason and science. They try to make it a versus issue. Faith versus science. Faith versus reason. What they mean, what they're actually saying, they're not talking about faith. They're talking about blind faith. They put an implicit hidden adjective in there. As if faith just means ignoring your reason and senses and just choosing to believe in something. Well, I just have faith it happened. Right? Even immature Christians sometimes will use this language and it's not helpful to our great commission. It supports the idea of a blind faith. That's not what we believe according to scripture nor what we should be teaching. Belief is not a question of faith versus reason. Because the scriptures Christians claim to believe distinctly call out that we employ reason in our great commission. I don't think we can read Matthew 28, 19 and 20 without also then understanding 1 Peter 3, 15. It's not just believe in your heart. It says, in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Right? The reason... Emphasis is mine, but the word is right there. It's not just, well, because I feel it's true. Or because it feels good. That's not sufficient for the Christian. Our faith should be reasonable and not simply palliative. It's not just our particular opiate. It's not our deity drug of choice. Nor should it be for the one who is dismissive of the Christian. We need to disabuse them of that notion. I mean, we know there's plenty of times we employ faith with reason. Plenty of times. Anytime you ever heard of people who make a good faith estimate? That completely blind estimate? No, it's like, well, we're not entirely certain what the value is here, but there's a good faith estimate that it's worth roughly this much. It might prove it. That's made with reason. You don't know for certain, but there's a reasonable estimate of something's worth. It's a good faith estimate. Or you might move forward in a business deal with, with some take a venture with some partners. And there's some reasonable, there's some reasoned faith in that venture because it may fail, but you didn't just say, oh, I'm just going to close my eyes and start spending money and hope a business comes out of it. 
You can't claim empirical certitude, but it's a faith built on an informed and reasonable foundation. So what I want to do today is honor Jesus' commission and Peter's admonition. Let's reason for not just the resurrection, but all of redemptive history. What we believe is not a question of faith versus reason again, but faith with reason. And to do that in today's world, we actually have to start very broad. We need to look at religion 101 or discipleship 101. I was sitting down with someone to have a one-on-one or teaching like I am today. It's like it almost, you need to start today with answering a question that comes up all the time. Are all religions the same? It's a popular claim, actually. It's a popular response. Like, well, I mean, ultimately all religions are kind of the same. A lot of people like to throw that out there. And if I answer that yes, if any of us actually hold to that, I want to say tactfully, that would highlight a poor power of deduction. Arthur Conan Doyle, writer of Sherlock Holmes. If you heard somebody say, well, all religions are essentially the same, he'd probably write another Sherlock Holmes story where he has Watson slap me in the face. Don't say that. Are all religions the same? Please. Are there similarities? Yes. Cats and dogs have similarities too. They have four legs. They are, some of them are roughly the same size. But if my wife sent me to go bring home a corgi and I brought home a hairless sphinx cat, I would get a slap in the face. I mean, well, honey, they all have four legs. They both can be house trained and domesticated. They share actually quite a bit of DNA similarity. Like, trust me, no, Mr. Bigglesworth is going back to the store. Or single guys, single guys in the room. How about if you brought this lovely gal home to meet the parents? Hey, Chimpiana and I share 96% DNA similarity. That's just science, okay? So this is going to be a great marriage, right? I like to play the video games. She picks grubs off me. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a match made in heaven, right? 96% similarity. 4% means this fails utterly, doesn't it? It's condescending at best to say, oh, there's all these similar, oh, they're all basically the same. That's condescending or sometimes, or maybe just ignorant, or sometimes, I guess, sometimes it's just a band-aid for polite dinner conversation. All religions are basically the fa- same, fails utterly. The answer is no, and we can reason against this claim like we just did. Again, it's condescending at best, it's, it's just ignorant at worst. I said, then from there we might go, okay, fine then. If there is a God, and he has been communicating truth to his creatures, to his creations, to us, well, and I guess I better pull out the big religious, eye ch- the big religious chart and graph. I guess I better look at all the world religions and figure out which one's right. Like, okay, wait a minute first. Don't do that, not so fast. First, we have an important, should all religions on a flat plate get credence just because they happen to be on the plate today? For instance, let's say a hack science fiction writer decided he'd write a religion just in the 20th century about an alien dictator named Xenu and some thetans that attach themselves to human beings. Would we give that the same credence? Well, I'm going to look at that just as seriously as, you know, Hinduism. No, it'd be ridiculous. We might not give the same time and effort looking at an enduring worldview as we would to one that just Tom Cruise and a handful of other guys believe in, right? That's a, that's a two-dimensional view. I'll just pull out the religions that are around today. No, no. We actually have to take our present two-dimensional menu and stretch it out into at least three dimensions to give it the scope of religious through line throughout all of human civilization and history. In fact, I'd want to use my reason to look at at least five important things. Longevity. Growth, continuity, evidence of claims, and uniqueness. What stands out? All religions aren't the same. All religions don't lead to the same path. And if they are different, which one is better or which one reasonably seems more likely to be true? Or truest? Or reasonable? If we wanted to start with longevity, we actually wouldn't Start by saying the term Christianity. What are the two oldest and still surviving religions throughout recorded human history to today? You'll find, really, that we're only dealing with two of any great significance. 
We effectively find very little else that has such deep roots and still remains today except Judaism and Hinduism. Judaism boasting a very different view from Hinduism in that there's one God, personal God. Judaism is fiercely, sharply monotheistic, one God. Hinduism, rather than, would say that they would say they're what they call no single idea of God. They would use the term Brahman, the absolute, the impersonal, the all-embracing spirit. And within that, many lesser deities, one God among many gods, and also all is God, all reality itself is God, you and I are expressions of God. It's what they call pantheistic versus monotheistic. Those are your two oldest stretching back into earliest documents, understandings. Now, how old are both of these? They're both just a little shy of 4,000 years old. Not many others have stood that test of time that old, still around. They're just not there. You, you find a little sprinkling of somebody still worshiping Zeus or something, you know, who knows, but not many others have stood that test of time or even come close. Judaism starts with a man named Abraham. About 3,800 years ago. By this we say then the origin is Abrahamic in nature. Hang on to that term Abrahamic for a little later. All right, we see, according to the scriptures, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I'm God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. You'll be the father of, the, of a multitude of nations. Kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your offspring after you. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. It's an Abrahamic religion, Abrahamic faith. Hinduism includes a diversity of ideas on spirituality and traditions, but it has no ecclesiastical order no unquestionable religious authorities, no governing body, no prophet, nor any binding book. Hindus can choose to be polytheistic, monotheistic, pantheistic, mono, uh, monistic, agnostic, atheist, humanist. It stands in sharp contrast. It's, it's obvious, the differences. We're not talking 96% DNA similarity even. It's absolutely in contrast to Judaism. In the book of Isaiah, we see God says very sharply and distinctly, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there's none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. Right? This is pretty much the diametric opposite of Hinduism. Hinduism doesn't offer the same insistence on being the only truth as other religions do. There's no eternally dominant or correct form of Hinduism. It's not a set of static beliefs. It continues to develop. It also explains history in circular and nonlinear terms with no starting and end point. In Judaism, we see both, in fact, a beginning and an end. There's a God that created the world, the universe, it had a beginning, and it will have an end. And within that, then, in Judaism, we see a story of redemptive history, God interceding in his creation again and again with a narrative of known relationship Broken by man, but then reestablished with a chosen remnant amidst all the chaos and distortion. Right? Hinduism and Judaism, it's like the meme, we are not the same. Right? Judaism is like one of those restaurants with a fixed menu. It's laid out for you, a three-course meal, a succession of covenants. Hinduism is like going to Old Country Buffet. You can take a bit there, you can take a bit here, pick and choose, there's no set menu. You can keep going back and forth again and again, we call that reincarnation. Or maybe, maybe at Old Country Buffet regurgitation, but, right? I, hey, it's funny because it's true. Um, but something else from that verse in Isaiah. God said he's declaring the end from the beginning. In Judaism, the universe had a beginning. God is creator. In Hinduism, the universe is eternal. Right here, I can stop and ask myself, if I believe in science and reason with my faith, which one aligns thousands of years later with our best science and reason as we understand it? Oh, the universe had a beginning. And likely studies indicate even entropy, it'll have an end one way or the other. That aligns much closer. There's an understanding relatively recent in science as far as human civilization goes 
that Judaism's been claiming all along. Now, the spark or source, obviously, we're going to debate. Random Big Bang, guided hand, but had a beginning. Well, what does that tell me if I want to employ faith with reason? What seems more reasonable? Either the universe had a beginning, or the universe is this eternal thing and I'm actually part of God. Now, Hinduism has some appeal there, doesn't it? We might ask ourselves, do I, do I feel like I'm part of God? I act like I am sometimes. I act like I am God. But if I'm honest, I, I don't feel like God or part of God. In fact, oftentimes, if there is a God, I maybe feel disconnected or out of sorts with him at various times in my life. Or maybe I even feel out of sorts, some of us, with the idea of God. It's not unreasonable to suppose if there was an objective truth in an objective universe, and if there was a God who created and ordered a reasonable universe, well, then that God would be both reasonable but also knowable. That's why I looked at longevity first. Has this God made himself known since the beginning? That begs our question of our origin, of our state, of our posture toward a creator. See, stop me if you've heard this one again, because it's very popularly said today. You've probably seen it if you're watching some scientific or philosophical documentary on religion, or maybe something in Time Magazine, or the Discovery Channel. It'll be ever since, it goes something like this, ever since man could reason, he's looked up in the sky and wondered, why am I here? What is my purpose? Who made me? Am I cosmic accident or a product of intention? Right, you've heard something like that. What if that's a dumb assumption? Let's be clear, it hasn't been the dominant assumption throughout human history, to be sure. What if humankind didn't start by looking up in wonder? What if we started in harmonious relationship? Not wondering, but in wonder of a creator that was known, understanding God and the universe with a job description and a purpose. What if that's how it started and something broke that? There was a fall. Consider, if you will, that we once knew, but then something was lost, a paradise lost, if you will. Mankind knew its maker, knew his purpose. It wasn't something wondered. It was something that's been woefully misplaced. Romans chapter 1 says we suppress the truth in our unrighteousness, that we sin, that we have pride, self-centeredness, sin. That, that, that our relationship was fractured. All right, when we take that assumption, oh, I guess man's probably just sort of always, since our earliest brain function, sort of looked up and wondered if there was a... Well, that would, that would actually lean more toward Hinduism, right? There's no fall in Hinduism. Judaism would tell us mankind was in a harmonious state and fell from grace. Hinduism, which regards the material universe to partake of both good and evil elements without moral purpose, doesn't require a doctrine of fall. Belief that humanity fell from a primordial state of unity with God is a doctrine of the Abrahamic faiths. Remember, I talked about those. Judaism is just one of them. And similar beliefs are also found in the mythology of many primal, primal religions. So the majority view throughout human history has been there was an understanding of God broken. Now, why might that be? Anybody ever heard of the telephone game? I know with the age of smartphones, that, that's probably some being lost. The telephone game, like, what does that mean? I, I, I play games on my smartphone. No, a person whispers a message. You have everybody sit down or you kind of stand up and you have to whisper a message in somebody's ear and that person will turn and whisper it to the next person and they'll turn and whisper it to the next person. And after it goes through like 15 people, it doesn't even sound remotely the same. It's been distorted because somebody said one word wrong and somebody misheard and so it... it the reality of the message gets distorted over time. It's a metaphor for accruing error, error. And that's why it doesn't surprise me that as human civilization, we have many gods, many religions, similar ideas emerge. Zeus is pretty much the same as Jupiter, right? Because the telephone game, if we were once connected, but it's been being whispered over years and being distorted over years, well, then the next question arises, like, so does James, are we all off the mark then? Has it got distorted completely? Are all religions wrong? Are, are, all, sorry, are they all just various? This is where we get to something like people will talk about the blind man and the elephant. That we're all feeling a different part of the same thing, but we don't understand the fullness. The problem is, the premise of that story is that someone, the storyteller or the king, is actually 
informing his subjects who can see about the blind ones who can't see. It's not a story about how there's no objective truth or can be known about God or faith. There's actually a king with vision explaining it to sighted people that he's brought in to show them the problem. Again, if God wanted to maintain the truth, the reality is he wouldn't be thwarted by our telephone games. If he was God, we might play telephone games and there might be a bunch of different, very distorted ideas of God that pop up. But man can't thwart God if God doesn't want to be thwarted. What if despite humans invariably distorting, he has made a clear line from primordial to present and this fallen state, though we distort it with tons of ancient religions, many of which haven't survived, Many have faded away, but what if it holds on in one of the two eldest because it is the reality? So we can ask ourselves a question about Judaism and Hinduism. Would we prefer a smorgasbord wherein we get to postulate whatever God, gods, whatever path and ethics seems best to us with nothing actually authoritative over us? That seems like what many other religions across history actually seem to indicate was the problem. Our fall. I get to pick and choose. My dad told me if something sounds too good to be true, it probably is. If God or God consciousness is something in me I just need to uncover and discover, then I guess I'm going to choose Hinduism. But of the two oldest religions, I know which one I'm leaning toward. It hits me with some hard but persistent truths. It asks me to be humbled and realize something is broken in me. It's not in line with my hubris, it's actually humbling. Not to mention a universe that has a beginning which aligns with science and reason. And so there's another aspect to look at then. We've already said they two that survive today. There's another aspect of longevity to consider though, and that's its sustainability. Or sustainability, continued existence, or growth. See, now I'm ready to look at that today's pie chart of religions. And we find an interesting conundrum. We look at the major religions today Judaism isn't there. 0.02% of the world. That's, that's rough. In fact, Hinduism makes the top five, but even it's been supplanted. Christianity, Islam, and secular atheists, actually. The top three. Atheists aren't new, by the way, as if science supplanted religion. Psalms says the fool says in his heart there is no God. Atheists have been around for thousands of years. The world is contended with outright deniers in every generation. It's, it's not new. Now, Hinduism could make the top three and bump secular out of that seat if you bound Hinduism and Buddhism together. Why, why would you do that? Because Buddhism actually comes out of Hinduism. With Buddha, about 500 BC, he was raised Hindu. And Buddhism really isn't about God. It doesn't even require a belief in God. It's just about walking a path of self-enlightenment. As religions go, it's basically agnostic. Buddha never claimed to be God. So the two are actually interrelated. They're connected. So if our goal is getting through telephone game distortion and discerning a potential through line of a maker that's been communicating truth since the beginning, like, well, Judaism has waned. That almost seems like maybe something's wrong there. But the two biggest are what? Christianity and Islam. And there's the key. Remember how I just said that Buddhism and Hinduism have connections? Christianity and Islam are two of three Abrahamic religions. We're back to that. I said remember it, right? Along with Judaism. They're interrelated. They're connected. The Abrahamic religions are all tied together here. 2,000 years ago, Jesus stood in Galilee, Jerusalem, Nazareth, and other places all throughout Israel, and he validated. What did he do? He said, the beliefs of the Hebrews of Israel is the genuine one. 2,000 years ago, he said, Judaism is right, Jewish faith is right, but Jesus Christ then claimed the continuity of that. So if we look at the two oldest remaining religions in the world, Jesus Christ came around 2,000 years ago and said, the Jews are right, that is the one true God. But from before Abraham to Moses and all their history and prophecy, this is the way, not Hinduism, not its extensions like Buddhism or offshoots, he also proceeded to claim he was the fulfillment of all the accumulated messianic promises within that faith. That he was God incarnate there to reconcile the broken relationship wherein we'd lost our standing with God. And he does that. We see it in places like Luke chapter, Luke chapter 4. 
It says he was teaching in the synagogue and read the words of the Hebrew prophets saying, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And the eyes of all the synagogue at the time were on him. And he began to say to them, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. He's saying, they're talking about me. It's the same thing later in Luke 24. We see him on the road to Emmaus. And he's talking with two disciples. And he's talking about how he's real and resurrected. He says then in verse 27, then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. What scriptures is he referring to? The Jewish scriptures up to that point. He's saying that's the true vision of God that's been contained, maintained for continuity for thousands of years before me. And now I'm the fulfillment of it. And now it's going to follow after me. We meet with the 11 disciples. He says, everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. See, the original Christians were Jews who simply recognized Jesus as their promised hope. So in the first century then, we see it's just an issue of different beliefs among Jews. The Jewish faith is splitting. Many didn't believe Jesus and held to the temple and sacrificial system until 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. And so what we see is then from Jews at the time of Jesus, it has grown. Now, the message of Christ was it's not exclusive to Jews. Gentiles get folded in. Started inviting the non-Jews as adopted members of God's family in expansion. That's this great commission Jesus gives us in Matthew 28. Meanwhile, the essential temple and center of Judaism's worship is destroyed in 70 AD and it's never been rebuilt. So Christianity and modern Judaism both represent a divergence in dramatic ways of that same Abrahamic faith. In fact, fast forward to those who are ethnically Jews today. We're not talking about Jews versus Christian. Jewish people today, the Jewish population in America is 7 million. I think actually now almost 2%, 2.2 million are Christians. Jewish Christians in Russia represent 17% of the Jewish population. So this isn't Jewish faith versus Christianity. It's modern Judaism versus Christianity, which was born through that same Abrahamic faith testified from Moses up to Jesus and then claimed by Jesus as the path of continuance. Remember the promise to Abraham said, you'll be a nation and through you all the nations of the world will be blessed. And that's actually transpired in human history since Jesus, since that was made promise to Abraham and Jesus' great commission. What has flourished? What's among the largest number? What has spread to every corner of the earth as Jesus told us to do? So realistically, we're looking at two chains of history, longevity and continuity. The Abrahamic pathway has three monotheistic branches. I mentioned Judaism, Christianity, and you can say, well, what about Islam, James? That's right, it's not just Judaism and Christianity, but Islam. Why do I save it for last? Well, because it was chronologically. It doesn't emerge until 650 years after Christ with a man named Muhammad who had a nightmarish experience in a cave and thought he'd been tormented by a demon until his wife and cousin convinced him it was the angel Gabriel. And so a religion forms by claiming ties to Abraham's faith. But instead of claiming fulfillment of the Old Testament and continuance like Jesus did, Islam reroutes God's path all the way back to the beginning of covenant relationship with Abraham, changes some of the players, relegates the Jews to enemies, downgrades Jesus to a lesser prophet, and denies his death and resurrection and its significance. In comic book lingo, I would gently call that a retcon. And there simply is no comparison to be had here. Muhammad and Jesus, no comparison. Jesus didn't kill people and have people killed who displeased him. Jesus didn't take a nine-year-old to be one of his many wives. And the real abuses, yes, you say, well, Jesus' followers throughout history have had some abuses. Yes, but Jesus' words and Jesus' actions didn't inspire a religion to kill for. We look at many martyrs from the original disciples, even Jesus' brother, we see it's a, it's a religion deemed worth dying for. He preached a truth so powerful it's been deemed not worth not killing for, but laying down one's own life for, as Christ claimed he did for us. Now, Christians worship the man who reached back and proclaimed a validation of one of the oldest surviving religions of his day, of all human history, that 2,000 years later we still have today. One of the few remaining continuous claims claiming who God is and how we relate to him. 2,000 years ago, Christ pointed back to that longevity and said, that's the real God. 2,000 years later, it has unparalleled growth. With him as that critical link 
in which it has the longest chain of continuity. Right? We celebrate this man who said he was the culmination of Judaism's core prophecies and literally God among us. So much that we even speak of the calendar, most of the world in terms of B.C., before Christ, and Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. And speaking of continuity, the Bible itself, 66 book books accruing over 4,000 years that all interreference each other. I love this visual of all the cross-references. It's unique amongst all other holy books in both span of time and continuity. On top of that, there's no recorded historical figure in a faith that survives to this day that even comes close to the claims and culminations surrounding this historical figure, Jesus Christ, that no modern scholar debates whether he was historical or not, just whether he was actually God or rose from the dead or not. Now, does all that weight prove it to be the one that's true? Perhaps not, but it proves it utterly and reasonably unique amongst all other claims. What else is unique? What else stands out? Oh yeah, he claimed to be God. Claimed to be God incarnate. In Mark, the earliest gospel, the most common way Jesus talks about himself is as the Son of Man, which is a reference to Daniel 7, again, the Hebrew Scriptures, where we have a figure with exalted and divine characteristics. It's a claim to deity. In John 10, he says, I and the Father are one. He's saying, I and the Father are the same thing. They try to stone him. And why? They don't try to stone him for being a revolutionary or a contrary rabbi. But clearly, they say, quote, for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. John 8, 58, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham, I am. Right? He's taken it all the way back. I'm the founder of your Abrahamic faith. At the time of the crucifixion, when he's asked, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? He says, I am, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One. It's referencing Psalm 110. It's the only major religion where the central figure claims to be God among us. That's also unique. And not just God alone. It's even more unique that he claims to be, what does he tell us to go do that commission in the name of? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Not just one name, three names. Genesis 1 tells us God created the world. John chapter 1 tells us that God created the world by his word, and the word became flesh, the Son of God. Back to Genesis when it says that he's creating the world, it says the Spirit of God's moving over the face of the water. We see all three at his baptism. The Father speaking from the heavens, the Son being baptized, the Spirit descending like a dove. It's the triune nature of God that, again, I find this fascinating. Remember the striking difference between our two oldest streams, Judaism and Hinduism? Judaism, fiercely monotheistic, there's one God. Hinduism and many other religions that have come and gone, pantheons of gods, right? Zeus and Odin. Remember the telephone game we talked about? I think that the whole multiple gods thing is a distortion in this felt paradox of the Trinity. Heck, Hinduism even has its own trinity. It has many gods. They're all Brahma, but then there's also a Brahma incarnate Vishnu and Shiva. It's like, a, it's like a clown mirror of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's the telephone game. It's distortion. In fact, that's an, again, that's another reason that the Jews rejected Christ because they were conf part of their confusion was we're holding on so fiercely to monotheism that on one hand is true. So there's only one God, three persons, the Trinity, but it's just more complex than many of them were willing to receive. Islam would then, 650 years later, reject it too, making Christianity, again, singular in its teaching, distinct, unique. But that's just two facets of uniqueness. I, I hit them before I hit on evidence. Right, as I mentioned before, Jesus is recognized almost universally as a true historical figure. Does that prove that he was everything he claimed? Of course not. No honest historian debates his existence. He's not mythical. But did he rise from the dead? There's a great book called The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. He presents his book, a case for what he calls the four E's of evidence. Evidence of the, re of the resurrection. First, the execution. The evidence for the execution, he says, is so strong historically because not only do we have multiple sources in the New Testament, we have five ancient sources outside of the New Testament scriptures that confirm and corroborate his execution. We have no record of anyone surviving a full Roman crucifixion. It wasn't just that he was mostly dead. This isn't the Princess Bride. He was dead. He was crucified. That's, that's established in and out of the New Testament. Early accounts then, the second one, second E. Most people like Lee Strobel, who was an atheist. He thought Jesus' resurrection and divinity was just a legend that accrued over time. It generally takes, according to A.N. Sherwin White, the great Oxford scholar, takes at least two generations of time for a legend to grow up and wipe out a solid core of historical fact. But we have... And this is a key bit of evidence for Strobel, part of his conversion to Christianity. 
We have a creed of the earliest church that says Jesus died for our sins, according to the scriptures, was buried and rose on the third day. That's something Christians were saying in the first generation. It's the same generation, not a retroactive legend over polish. It was formulated within months of Jesus' death. Again, not just written about in the Bible, but even in extra-biblical sources. And then we have the empty tomb. For Strobel, the most convincing piece is what the skeptics said. They didn't say, this is baloney, go to the tomb, you can find his body. This whole resurrection thing is bogus. What they said was, oh, well, the, oh, the disciples stole the body. They're implicitly conceding that the tomb is empty. And then there, to top that off, we have the fourth E, the eyewitnesses. We're lucky in the ancient world if we usually have one or two sources to confirm a fact, but, but for the conviction of the disciples they had encountered the resurrected Christ, we have nine ancient sources from inside and outside the Bible confirming and corroborating his appearances. The resurrection really confirms his identity of being the Son of God. And on top of that, first-generation Christians were willing to die for it, including Jesus' brother, die for the fact that this guy was God. And it didn't get them any power or wealth. In fact, one of the early per persecutors, the Jew named Saul, went from being a member of the Sanhedrin with all the perks to getting turned 180 to following Jesus at nothing but cost to his per physical and emotional health. No benefit, no gain. That's somebody who crazily believes it's true or it's true. Brought him no status, no wealth, no benefit. Entirely the opposite. Everyone going crazy for no advantage? Lying for no advantage? Is it what's most reasonable to believe, at least they believed? That's another aspect of uniqueness in terms of the reasons to believe from an earthly perspective across most generations in human history where Christianity has truly flourished, when it grows the fastest and the most virulent. It's usually when it's not a smart move to be a Christian. It gets you ostracized. It gets you, it gets you thrown out. Maybe it gets you killed. It's usually believed despite consequences, not for the consequences. Almost as if a divine hand was guiding and growing it despite the odds. And finally, perhaps the most unique and most important thing, Christ's death and resurrection. What did it claim to accomplish? What did it accomplish? Ephesians 2 says, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Now this is unique. How do we get right with God, the universe, and everything? For any, anyone who feels there may be a God from the, from the anyone who's not a diehard atheist, agnostic, to ardent religious person, that's the question. Like, how would I get right with my creator, with the universe, with everything? Hinduism, karma would say I need to accrue, I need to work on my karma. That's achieving and accruing merit. Islam would say we're saved by good works. It's merit-based. Almost every religion out there except Christianity has some form of works-based self-saving aspect that it is dependent upon each of us trying to balance some kind of cosmic scale. Enough good to counteract the bad. But here's the kicker. Reasonably, using our mind and reason, is that really how justice works? I did this with children at a Bible camp, and they were unspoiled enough to get it easier than maybe some of us. If I've stained myself with all sorts of evil deeds, even if I do nothing but good stuff and I'm perfect for the rest of my life, does that get the stains out? It's like I'm standing there before a judge. I know you killed your wife, but James, you rescued 15 kittens from trees last week, so we're going to call it even. Right? Saving a life doesn't unkill the other one. A right over here doesn't redress the wrong over here. Damages still need to get paid. There's plenty of things we can never take back, never make restitution for. And that's the point of the cross, that God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, that Jesus paid it all, as Romans said. Grace flips the entire scenario around. With a works-based religion, it's I must ingratiate myself to God. A grace-based and the singular uniqueness of Christianity is that I just work in gratitude because of what God has done. Christ's path, utterly unique. I'm not earning my way into his favor. I'm working in gratitude because of his unmerited favor that he's bestowed upon me. See, don't get me wrong, Christian life has works. The cynic might say, well, what's the difference? You're still working, there's still works. It's like, no, it's like, it's like saying I obey mom or dad hoping that they will love me and let me come home. 
versus I obey mom or dad because I know they've loved me and they've sacrificed for me and I know I have a home. That scenario is utterly different. In this case, a big brother, the son of God, Jesus, took my just punishment for sin and then rose from the dead and invited me to be adopted into the family. My first Peter 3 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. That's us. That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who's gone into heaven, isn't at the right hand of God. As the Christian concept of grace stands out in a radical contrast to every other religion out there made by man. They put, the others all put man somehow in the driver's seat. This puts God in the driver's seat and makes us forgiven and grateful passengers. So Jesus stands at the center point of one of the oldest surviving truth claims about who God is and who we are in light of that. Jesus claimed to address the central problem of that disconnect and claimed to be the singular path to reconciliation. Jesus said how God's people would grow, and 2,000 years later, it's come to pass. Jesus said he was the answer to Abraham's promise that all the nations would be blessed, and his message has indeed circled the globe. And if we truly do understand history, the influence of Christianity, even just on the moral state of global understanding of human dignity and worth has been changed irrevocably. Also, the worshipers of Jesus have gone from a dozen to billions. And that's what we teach. That's what we're discipling and teaching and baptizing people into. That is the story of redemptive history. When someone asks for the reason for the hope that I have and profess, I can point to the longevity of what we believe. It's growth unprecedented and unparalleled. It's continuity, a through line that has stood the test of time and ages and philosophy and reason. There's evidence of which we've only scratched the surface today. Much of that not only unique in form, but in singular and unique solution. And one that humbles us, so it's, a, it's in one sense a bitter pill, pill to swallow, whereas other religions have more attractive to you kinds of things. It strips us of a self-assent in exchange for a God-initiated embrace between man and maker. Now, in honest, in John, honestly, I could just close with that. I say, that's one through five, that's enough. But if I'm honest, all those five weren't enough to penetrate this heart. Not, not to penetrate my hard heart. Scripture says to give a reason for the hope that you have. I think all of us could learn and steep ourselves and be able to articulate one through five there. But then each of us may have a unique facet in mine. All those other five were like straws on my camel's back. But I still managed to not break. Unlike Augustine of Hippo, unlike C.S. Lewis, G.K. Chesterton, and more, I actually like them in some ways. I, I need my story, I needed something more. And I'd add a sixth one I would just say is beauty. Beauty, not evidential weight so much as artful weight, perhaps. I was an English major, I was a cinephile, I loved movies, right? A cinephile, I probably loved sin too, that was, right? But I loved fiction, I loved narrative, I loved books and film, anybody that's been here for a while knows that. The great adventures, the hero's journey, the epics, and kind of what is it about mankind that drives us to create story and theater and passion plays, not just to live life, but to artfully reflect it? Why is it that if you examine Western literature, everything from Western literature to kabuki theater, you find the same rhythms over and over again? Joseph Campbell called it the three-act structure, this hero with a thousand faces. If you look through recurring story structure, the same warp and woof has kind of been woven throughout culture and our art forms. Sometimes it's three acts, sometimes it's five. The organizational mind kind of may break it down differently, but it always deals with the fact that there was a beginning. There was a beginning, there was a once upon a time, there's then an inciting incident or a problem, a conflict, and then in the climax of act one, we see a reparative journey begin. And in the middle usually is the darkest part, somewhere near the center, a pivotal part, it gets dark and there's a pivotal midpoint, an unexpected twist, some kind of climax. And then, we're, then you're moving toward the final act, building and building toward a crescendo and the climax, the consummation. And then either that story ends in despair or it ends in happily ever after. Sometimes a mixed bag for the assembled cast. We keep telling that story. Why? Why? Is it another just happenstance of accidental creatures in our meaningless proclivities? Or are we innately seeking to reflect life and something our maker has woven throughout all of history, that it's a redemptive history, that our, that our history is actually a story playing out. And nothing satisfies this like the fullness of the message Jesus Christ commissioned us to carry, friends. That there was a creation and a fall. And within that creation, then there was a fall, the inciting incident. 
But then there was a call and a covenant at the end of Act 1. That's Abraham. A call and a covenant toward a reparative journey. And a promise made. And then things got really dark at the center point and there was a cross. And on that cross, the unexpected twist, the Messiah coming in a way no one foresaw yet fulfilled everything. When things are at their darkest, Christ dies and then rises in what is ultimately the crippling blow and then we're moving toward the third act and the climax. The hope and message has gone viral, gone global. And now we're wait, we wait the second coming, the consummation, the kingdom, the return of the king, Jesus. For those who trust in his grace, it's happily ever after. For the rest, it's just recompense. That's the beauty of God as a storyteller, simple yet artful, elegant and emblematic of why we carry this structure in our storytelling souls. And that's what finally, that was the sixth straw that broke my camel's back and actually my heart. Now, cynic could say, I suppose, well, it just shows another fabricated religion that simply reflects this quirky human animal's aptitude. But if we're more than flesh, if we're made in the image and likeness of God, then this form and format revealing that we're reflect, reveals we're reflecting his monomyth, the true hero's journey, the ultimate. That all the fictional journeys of my story shape whole, all my fictional saviors from Superman to the Lone Ranger, Optimus Prime, whatever, Batman, all the fictional odysseys to deal with the problem of evil like Frodo carrying the ring. All the fictional redemptions from Fyodor Dostoevsky to Charles Dickens, crime and punishment to a Christmas carol. All of that weight. It's us reflecting. And so I didn't, James didn't need, I didn't need to witness the empty tomb. I wasn't there. But I needed the fullness of understanding God's narrative to break my heart. I didn't need to literally see his risen hands with nail holes. But I needed the joy of seeing how the gospel actually fills in life's plot holes. All the aspirations of our melodramatic souls mellowed by the most magnificent passion play played out across a universe in redemptive history as our brokenness is mended by his grace. So I'll close with this verse. Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power were being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Through him, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Friends, this is the reason for the hope that I have. And this is one glimpse, one way, that we might carry out God's great commission. It's the hope that I have, not as if it's mine, as if I sought it or conquered it or championed it as my victory. It's mine on bended knee, submitting to the true story in which I am merely a supporting player and by his grace, a vocal spectator. So as we leave today, I just say the challenge is, What's your reason for the hope that you have? What's your answer as an ambassador to Christ as you carry out the commission? When your child comes to you, when your friend comes to you, when the stranger asks, or when you have an opportunity for a pulpit, will you have it formulated? Will you have it articulated? Will you have it ready to share? I think if we want to be participants in that commission, we need to say more than just, well, it's what I believe. Like Peter, like Paul, like Lee Strobel, like many others. They might want to work on that reason for the hope that we have so that friends and family and others can know it isn't blind. It's reasonable and it's right. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you this morning. Thank you that we can worship you in spirit and truth and understanding that you don't just leave us as blind followers. That you equip us with knowledge. That you equip us with wisdom. That you equip us with direction. Lord, may we receive that. May we understand the depths of what you've been doing throughout all of history, not just in our lives, and not even just with the cross 2,000 years ago, but understanding that is such an amazing fulcrum of our faith, a faith that stretches back in multiple directions that stretches back to our origins and our beginning 
and in which we move forward toward your climax and your crescendo and your end. I pray others would feel passionately welcomed and invited into that, that others would look at the reasonable faith that you have given us, and that your spirit would help them to know it is right and true and life in you. Amen.